The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre-recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you Talk Station, Faith Matters. And welcome to Faith Matters here on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm joined by Reverend Robert Cornegie uh, and also uh, Bishop Doc Loomis as we discuss uh, some of the faith uh, subjects in the news of late. And um, my name is Ben Ball, and thank you for joining us here today on Faith Matters. Our first article we're going to look at today is from the National Catholic Reporter, and the headline is, Francis calls on global leaders to abolish death penalty, provide health care, and forgive debt. As we record this on a Thursday, it happens to be the Pope's birthday, too. So Pope Francis is celebrating that today. But his message that came out is the, is the message for 2016, uh, and it is titled Overcome Indifference and Win Peace, including a section on peace in the sign of the Jubilee of Mercy. The headline refers to what comes at the end of this uh, particular message from Pope Francis, but I'll begin with the opening paragraph uh, here from the article by Joshua McElwee. In the name of his ongoing Jubilee Year of Mercy, Pope Francis has strongly called upon global leaders to make what he has termed courageous gestures of concern for those left most in need of society, by society, especially prisoners, migrants, and the unemployed. Among the pontiff's requests made Tuesday with the publication of his annual message for the upcoming World Day of Peace, abolition of the death penalty, conditions for legal residency for migrants, jobs for the unemployed, access to medical care for all, and forgiveness of international debt burdens. Uh, and in this, again, um, Robert, let me start with you. The Sort of the traditional biblical idea of, the, of Jubilee was a forgiveness of debt. I mean, that's it's actually something that would... Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, that was the um, 50th year after the seven-year cycles, right. every seventh year. The land was to rest, and then on the uh, the fiftieth year of of that cycle, they were to restore all ownership back to owners. All slaves were set free. Everything went back to its was supposed to go back. Yeah, yeah. the only problem time, was it, didn't actually it never happen. happened. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, in the in this uh, World Day of Peace message, then he he does speak to that. Uh, at the towards the end of the message, he makes a threefold appeal. I'll read uh, from his message with this in mind, in which he's gone through a lot of things, uh, especially talking about how uh, not to be uh, ambivalent or to let's see what's the the phrase he uses from indifference to mercy, not Correct. to have indifference to mercy. He says, "I would like to make a I like to make a threefold appeal to the leaders of nations to refrain from drawing." other peoples into conflicts or wars which destroy not only material, cultural, or social legacy, but also, and in the long term, their moral and spiritual integrity. To forgive or manage in a sustainable way the international debt of the poorer nations and to adopt policies of cooperation which instead of bowing before the dictatorship of certain ideologies, respect the values of local populations and in any case not prove detrimental to the fundamental and inalienable right to life of the unborn. Uh, so he, he speaks about the things that were in the headlines, but much more. You've said during the break or before we got started that he really was covering a lot of bases here. So Yeah, it, I couldn't help, but the first thing that popped in my mind when we uh, joined Mercy Ships years ago and we went to live on the Anastasis, we were given a handbook. I mean, it was a binder mm -hmm. with just you know thick thing. And on the cover of it was was the title, and the title was A Non-Comprehensive Guide to Life on the Anastasis. And I thought, wow. Non-comprehensive. Non-comprehensive. Yeah. And I said, now, we have a pretty comprehensive guide mm -hmm. to life on the planet Earth here from the Pope in uh, this year of Jubilee message of, of mercy and, and his standard for what is the moral basis for life on the planet Earth, for all people, not just Catholics or not just Christians, but for everybody on the planet. He's claiming there is a, there is a higher 
God-given moral um, code that exists, and he's defining the, those that are, have kind of fallen through the cracks of that. So it's a, you know, I mean, these are the kind of bully pulpit things that, um, that popes need to do, you know, because they are speaking, they are the, they are the, the vicar of Christ. So they are the voice of the, of the conscious, conscience of the church, of the Catholic church. So yeah, that's a very, very, um, I, I mean, who can argue? Right. It, it does seem to be a very difficult uh, position to argue. But uh, yeah. um, uh, Daka, it, he, it, it's not like we talk about the end of it here, but it's not like that he doesn't also re- uh, refer to our spiritual life. He says, we too then are called, are called to make compassion, love, mercy, and solidarity a true way of life, a rule of conduct in our relations with one, with one another. This requires the conversion of our hearts. The grace of God has to turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Uh, so uh, is is this a, s- a spiritual argument or a political argument or all of the above? Is, is, is what specifically an argument? I mean, well, the, well, the request, I would say, not the argument, but the, um, uh, the desire. His statements. His yeah. statements, uh, his, his uh, attempts to elicit change from nations. Well, I, I, I mean, I think ever since the, the Jubilee years have been, I mean, in, in modern time. So the last Jubilee was in 2000. For Roman Catholics, jubilees come every 25 years, not 50. Uh, that's been the more recent history, I think. Mm-hmm. And so I can remember the jubilee year in 2000, and that was the year. It's it's always the jubilee of mercy, and so it was the forgiveness of sins. And you may remember there was a, a papal indiction that came out in 2000 about <clears throat> um, uh, kind of what they called the jubilee indulgence, the idea that you could have your sins uh, your sins forgiven without having to visit, and you started to do confession, but you didn't have to go to multiple churches like you do in a jubilee year. Mm-hmm. And if this is getting carried away, let me know. But the mm-hmm. bottom line is, he's really not saying anything new this time that he didn't say. The year that this was a real political year was 2000, mm-hmm. because that's when the Jubilee Foundation and all these groups started up all across the world. In fact, there's one still in the United States, and the idea was to forgive all third world debt by the year 2000. Right. You remember that? Yeah, well, that's in this one, too. Yeah, yeah. so it, and it's going to be, I almost guarantee you it'll be in the next one. This jubilee was supposed to occur in 2025, but he, he as the Pope, can do a kind of a, what would you call that, an extra special jubilee year anytime he wants to, mm-hmm. sort of like the way that you know the English can call elections anytime they want to. Right. He can do that. And, yes, it's an. I think he felt, from what I understand, he felt, that if he waited till 2025, it was going to be too late, and that he needed to appeal to the world governments while he had them together discussing debt crisis, global warming, etc. That he felt this was the year to call for mercy. So he, I think, he fit a very spiritual thing into a political calendar. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, now he, he says even about debt. Remember, he says forgive, but also or manage in a sustainable way. He doesn't even explicitly call for all uh, third world debt to be right. to be uh, eliminated. I thought well, that yeah. was interesting. Yeah. Uh, in fact, all of these statements are somewhat qualified. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, but you said, uh, Robert, back on your point about uh, taking the moral ground, and, and do we look at this as being a moral edict, or is this just these are good things to do? Is it morally uh, re- required of us. Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when he talked about that, that this is only going to happen when you've had the revelation experience. I mean, basically, that's what you just read mm-hmm. that he said, right? That y- you really are incapable of doing this unless you've had the revelation experience. But we're going to lay it out there as the standard to which we are. God calls us. He's just reminding us that we're called to that standard. Uh, you know, I'm not. There, I'm not going to. D- Pick at the nits on this one, but you know that's that's excellent. Let's do that. We are, let's acknowledge that there is a there is a God given standard for morality, and so now he's calling a bunch of people to that standard that don't necessarily agree that that standard exists <laughs> exists or has authority over them or whatever. So when he's calling the nations to do this, 
this is a, 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 a um, just a reminder of what the church does. That's what we do. What, right. What he, it's what a confession. He is saying, what he's saying to the world is what we say to parishioners every day. This is what we tell Christians to do. This is how we should live. We should be forgiving people's debts. We should be showing them mercy. We should be forgiving their sins. We should be caring for them. All these things are wonderful. They're just. This is his opportunity to say to the body politic, to the leaders of the world, Look, this is how the church feels about this because this is how Jesus feels about it. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you could say that this is the Pope's worldview that he's communicating to other worldviews that may not share the same perspective, but he's he's kind of driving a stake in the ground and saying, as Christians, as followers of God, this is what we believe God calls us to do. Now, how that actually works out these other nations do that you know you can get into the theology of that but um for that for, to hold someone accountable to that standard that is not personally who does not believe he is personally accountable to that standard is is another matter yeah, well really for, any, for any christian that is looking for uh, a path to walk to make a change in their government that's what he does he lays that out yeah he says look if you're a christian person in in this country and you want to make a change for the better, for your country, for the world, for the poor, for the whatever, then this is this is the way we do that. This yeah. is how we feel about it. So yeah. go do that. Yeah. We'll have more to come in a moment here, including a, a different take on the worldview in just a bit here on uh, Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Thanks for joining us here. Reverend Robert Cornegy from Chapel by the Sea in Emerald Isle and uh, Bishop Doc Loomis from All Saints Anglican Church uh, joining us here as uh, as per usual. We miss Mark. We're going to be without Mark for Mark Woods from Cherry Point and I'm at this church probably for a few weeks. Uh, but as we look at uh, ne- our next story to talk about here, we're obviously in a Christmas season from Christmas to New Year's. You'll you'll hear this, but this is um, from uh, the Christian Post CP Opinion page. It's called "Atheists Want to Be Good." Atheists want to be good for goodness sake. Uh, it's Christmas time, uh, the season of good cheer. And it says the atheists are at it again, where we celebrate Jesus' birth. But rather than doing that, a group of called American Atheists invite us uh, by a way of their new billboard campaign to go ahead and skip church, just be good for goodness sake, as if that's even possible. Uh, the writer here is uh, Susan Stamper Brown, a guest contributor. She says, sure, anyone, including atheists, can do good works without acknowledging God, but that doesn't mean they do those good works apart from God because it's impossible to find good without also acknowledging good's creator, the moral lawgiver. Let's start there, Robert. Uh, uh, we, we're looking at uh, the call from uh, Pope Francis to essentially do good for God's sake. Uh, right. right, right, uh, and and uh, this is uh, echoing the old uh, Christmas song to be good for goodness' sake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and so, do they have a point or or not? Does the writer of the article have a point, or do the atheists have? Do a the point? atheists have a point? Either way, yeah. well, either way, uh, look, either I way. mean, everybody agrees that um, atheists can can um, do good. Mm-hmm. They can be moral people, and uh, but what they what they they kind of do what they. <laughs> friend of mine has just written a great book um it's called stealing from god and it's about the moral argument and what atheists do is they steal their morality basically basically from a biblical worldview they don't they don't even acknowledge that but they do they kind of sit on god's lap and and slap him in the face when they do that but uh um, the reality is mankind, as we understand it from the biblical perspective, is born with a conscience, with a, an awareness. It's a God-given, it comes with a kit, right? <laughs> Just as we have physical laws of the universe, 
Mm-hmm. No one really argues with that. That's what science is based on, that there are physical laws, gravity, whatever you want to um, use for, to uh, illustrate it. There are also moral laws that God has built into the universe. And if you break a physical law, there's a consequence. If you break a moral law, there's a consequence. And so every human being has within them a moral conscience. Now, to that can be, you know, as we use in the Bible language, you know, mm-hmm. we talk about seared and and uh, dead and all mm-hmm. these other things. The conscience can be affected, but there is this this basic concept of of what's right and what's wrong. I mean, you know, generally speaking. So, of course, someone who denies the existence of God does denying the existence of God deny the existence of God. No, it doesn't. It just means, does God exist whether you acknowledge his existence or not? Of course he does. God doesn't exist because you think he exists. God exists because he exists. He's the the uncaused cause, you know, from from a... right. Apologetical the, point of view, philosophical the, the point of view. Aquinas first mover, right? exactly right, prime mover, mm-hmm. right. So, what what uh, the atheist my professor does, would be proud by the well, way. Yeah, that that was good. <laughs> what the atheist does is basically say, "I don't need God to be good. I can just be good." But right. what and and no one would argue with that. The problem is, what is the basis? Here's here's the root of the deal. What is the basis for your good? Is it opinion, or is it something that actually exists? In this in this article, Brown says that uh, says if an objective standard of right and wrong, or good or evil, does not come from that moral law giver, then clearly everything is subjective, based on the whims uh, of whenever, however, and whomever the wind might blow on any given day. In the absence of those ten thou shalt nots, the word is world is a pretty nasty place to live. Um, Doc, what is your take on uh, either well, on either Well, on even this. with the ten thou right. shalt nots and right. thou shalt, it's a pretty nasty place to live. <laughs> yes. And I think that's because, you know, as, as Paul made it pretty, pretty, pretty clear and Jesus himself said, look, there really aren't any good ones. In fact, he didn't even want to be called good. He said, you know, why are you calling me good? The only one good is the Father. Right. So the law notwithstanding, I mean, mm-hmm. it's still a pretty nasty place. I think the thing from the the thing that gets me in this is just <laughs> this is how the Lord works. He does things for his glory, whether we do or not. He actually does not, you know, we think he does things for us, and isn't that nice that the Lord is, is blessing us and watching over us. But actually when God does stuff, he does things that he may be glorified. Is that right? Correct. I'm looking at two pastors here. Mm-hmm. just want to make sure you know, I'm not off the, off the charts here. That's a confession, the Westminster Confession. There you go. Sure. So. The thing is, when when I do good for goodness's sake, that's the thievery. That's right. Because I, what right. I'm stealing is I'm stealing the glory from the one who is the only one who should get glory for all things good because he's the only one that is good. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's Ezekiel 36 or and change somewhere in there. I'm pretty right. sure. And I think that any you know for a, for a Christian person. When you tell me that I can do something good, it actually winds up. And here's what here's where the, you see you said, Robert, they, that atheists can do good things and they can do moral things. And I say wrong because any work that's done, no matter how it appears in the world, that does not give the glory to God is actually a work of evil. It's actually a bad work. of the flesh. Of exactly. a work, well, work however you want to. Yeah. However you want to do it. So, what I would say is. Yeah, I totally get the argument. If God doesn't fit into your frame of reference, it suddenly makes a lot of sense. For the rest of us, for whom God actually fits into our frame of reference, we need to understand how he thinks. And what God thinks he thinks is that when you do a good work that is not done in my name, you have actually violated me, you've sinned against me, and you've robbed me of what is rightfully mine. Yeah, I like the way uh, it w- it's put that the um, the good that we do in and of our own strength sort of the temporal good, mm-hmm. is a good, but it's a temporal good. It's not an eternal good. Before I became a Christian, you know, I'd been a Boy Scout. So I would help little <laughs> old ladies across the street. Well, you know, that was, uh, she She would turn and look at me and say, well, you're a good boy. And I would say, yeah, I did a good thing. And I did. And that was my reward. 
I got it right then. It was a temporal reward. It was not an eternal reward. So it's almost as though there are two classifications of good that the world, the world operates in that temporal world of good. And Christians, as you say, operate in an eternal world of good, which is the true good. I'm not denying that a temporal good um, Rob is, robbing Rob God. is robbing God. Absolutely right. it is. But to the person that doesn't believe that eternal good ex- even exists out there, that's often good enough for them. And so that's that's where the argument, I don't, I don't know if you've had this discussion with an atheist. I have and, and several times. And, and that's where we have the, the conversation problem mm-hmm. is that I'm talking about a different category of good. It's a category mistake or fallacy. And they're talking about a different kind of good. And so when I try to draw them into the eternal good, mm-hmm. well, they don't even believe that exists. Okay, back off a, a second, uh, maybe a little bit um, um, a different kind of language, semantic language there, but the, the language that she was using about being subjective. Mm-hmm. Uh, with an atheist, can you have that conversation? Say, you know, if you are saying that something that you are doing is good or is, in your view, moral, uh, then uh, what if there were a different set of rules applied? Or you were going to say that you could, well, what is to keep you from deciding that, well, this is my place, this is my house, I'm going to decide what's good. Yeah, my good. Well, you know, and actually Richard Dawkins has written a book. I don't know if you've read his book. I recommend you read it. It's called God is Not Good. And Richard Dawkins is one of the leading fundamentalist atheists that are out there. He's, they call them the new atheists, and they are very aggressive in their evangelism um, against Christianity. I mean, they are mm-hmm. obviously, they're not just neutral about Christianity. They are anti-Christian. And so his, his title of his book, and a lot of college campuses are reading this book, mm-hmm. that God is not good. And so he brings that argument. He, he completely... Um, he tries to um, rebuke, or not rebuke, um, debunk the concept of a good and loving being that's out there, and he gives all kinds of arguments for that. So, so yeah, it's it's a fascinating debate, and that's really what she's referring to. She's using some of the moral argument positions to argue her position, but I think her language is somewhat simplified here. It is. Uh, So you say uh, for years now, some have done their best to expunge all references to God and Judeo Christian values from American daily life, except when they conveniently cherry pick or contort certain scriptures for political gain. That seems to be kind of a non sequitur some uh, somewhat to the rest of the article, but they promote unvalues based on historical unfacts suggesting their movement, which is really a religion of self adoration will reap positive results for the greater good in the absence of God. Uh, I think if Mark were here, let me, let me see if I can take the Markian position. We call it that. Uh, um, you going to channel Mark here. <laughs> uh, would, would be that this is a good thing to have this kind of argument because it means it, that means it forces us to take our understanding of God seriously. Is that, is, would that sound like a, uh, an argument there? Uh, yeah. Our understanding of the, of the moral uh, foundation, seriously. I, I just want to say, this is, a, this is a big argument for, for the atheist. This is a real important point for them. And they're going to fight to the death on this one, that they can have a morality that independent of the existence of God. Would that fight be moral? <laughs> Oh, we'll have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegy, we're talking about uh, articles that are expanding certain views. And and uh, this other one that came out this week is uh, from uh, The Federalist, and it's called The Christian Case for Libertarianism. The evils of government threaten all people, but ought to be particularly concerning to Christians. Written by Brian Hawkins. Ronald Reagan once said, I believe the very heart and soul of conservatism is libertarianism. 
with the Christian right now taking up the banner of religious liberty in the face of an onslaught by the secular left, evangelical conservatives should heed Reagan's word and consider libertarianism as a a palatable governing philosophy to advance their interests. In his book Anarchism, A History of Libertarian Ideas and Movements in 2004, George Woodcock defines libertarianism as a political philosophy that upholds liberty as its principal objective. Libertarians seek to maximize autonomy and freedom of choice, emphasizing political freedoms, voluntary association, and the primacy of individual judgment. Libertarianism is the natural, the writer goes on to say, is a natural political ideology for Christians because it promotes individual freedom. 1 Peter 2.16 reads, As free men, not yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Men live, men free from the chains of government can maximize our liberties to help our fellow man through private charity and evangelism. Uh, Bishop, uh, do you see this as a, um, as a, viable argument for libertarianism or for the Christian? This dude is spot on, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to send him a Christmas card. I mean, I love, <laughs> I absolutely love what he said. I mean, because I, like Reagan, I'm, I think I'm a little bit of a libertarian-leaning conservative, uh, and, that's, and that's really what Ronald Reagan was, and so he figures into this, obviously. Um, the kind of compassionate conservatism that, that George Bush, and in fact, I, we were talking during the break about John Kasich in Ohio, presidential candidate and Governor John Kasich, mm-hmm. calling for that kind of a government-sponsored compassion. Very different than what we're talking about here. Uh, the, the idea of, a, of being a libertine, being Christian, makes all the sense in the world to me. Uh, absolutely. This, I, I think he's, yeah, I think he's totally spot on. Robert, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. The um, one of the one of the challenges that we face in communicating um, this to other people, is, and and at at the, at the bedrock, I tend to be a libertarian. There's a difference between a libertarian and a libertine, and uh, unfortunately, what has happened. I don't know if you've gone on any of the libertarian websites. And looked at some of this stuff, but it's actually and and some of the responses to this, the comments to this article, I read some of those, and uh, there was a, there was an amazing um, reaction to the new libertarian political movement, which has basically become an atheist. Um, you know, it's not grounded. Just as we were talking about in these other articles, the Pope was calling to government, big government, to be a compassionate compassionate to the to the poor, the least advantage. Correct. Right. It's a government responsibility. It's not an individual responsibility. Well, in contrast to the article on the atheists, the atheists were calling on the individuals. Exactly. That's, what, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. That's it's right. It's become an atheist argument. Yes. The, the challenge is always the same with, with, with libertarianism, however. It's a wonderful practice in, in, a, in a nation until it comes to foreign policy. Right. Until it comes to mutual defense. That's where it all falls apart. Right. Because in order for it to be successful, every nation has to be libertarian. Correct. Yeah. You can't. It, so that, the, that, was, and that was the challenge that Reagan was confronted with. How can I be a libertarian-leaning conservative and still manage foreign policy? Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent point. It is also illustrates how the, the contemporary church, kind of the mainstream church, has abandoned libertarian principles. I mean, they, I mean, the, just as the Pope sort of illustrated that, the the you know he has gone to see that that the really the most powerful agent in world governance is government, the state, and so he's appealing to the states to respond um, rather than. Calling on the church. Calling on the church or calling on individuals. When the, that, and reinforcing what this article goes on and talks about is how we respond personally rather than by force. Because all the government can do is force you to do it. 
This um, Hawkins uh, says here, compassion and justifications for the welfare state are illegitimate because true compassion is based out of one's personal generosity. It's interesting that the Pope's message is is more corporate, looking at the uh, at the government side of it, or has that component in it. The atheist message was personal about how you can skip church and just do good for goodness sake. Good. The libertarian argument here is somewhat both: is that it's up to government to to help help free the people to to exercise that generosity and yeah to, it's giving away your own stuff not your neighbors right. that's that's the essence of charity isn't it right and that's what the church teaches correct better for us to die better for us to give you know that that's the idea it, and, but and, too often has ceded that over to government government yeah well, i mean look at the whole church this is why i pull what little hair i have left out over this idea that 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 the church has this dynamic role to influence government i i don't stand up in front of the church and ask people to influence their government i ask people to influence their neighbor i mean you know if your brother didn't have a cloak then give him the cloak that you have that's kind of the point of this whole thing and what's happening now is the church whether it's global warming or world poverty we've gotten into this thing where the church has to go and try and influence the government, and I know I'm on I'm on probably pretty thin ice with Robert here, being you know the shaker and the mover you are. But I'm telling you, if I can just convince one person to help a neighbor mm-hmm. and do that a few thousand times, I'm going to be way ahead. Well, the only disagreement I would have with that is, and that I knew it, there would be one, it, is that yes. it, that it, I would argue that it's not an hoping e- there would it's be not one. an either or. Right. right. I would say it's a both. I would say that we are to be personally involved in acts of personal compassion in our community, in our neighborhoods, in in all of that. And we work very hard at the church to get people involved because there is this kind of overlying, overarching concept now in our society that the government is the solution to a lot Mm -hmm. of our social problems. And a lot of people have bought that and that this is the new unified kind of human response is through human government and not through the old um, areas which used to be through the church and and the working of the church into that community through the church based hospitals and schools and and social services you know that but well are you saying that so you think that when the church moves toward toward that that very influential position in government does it feel to you like they're just codifying that that they're just saying yeah actually the world's right it is government we need to influence government really is the thing that matters no no not at all what i'm so, saying is well that's that, what it feels like yeah, is I mean, happening and I, 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 I can understand that how that may have, may yeah, have well, I can that. let me be a little careful okay. in, in the way i word this my mm-hmm. my um relationship with influencing government is to reduce the impact of government so that the government doesn't take as much from the individual. I think we're in this crisis point right now where a lot of Christians are unable to do the kind of good to their neighbors because the government is starting to take more and more of our resources for them to do that good. And so my influence on my um, fellow Christians and others is to say, let's look Let's work for a smaller government, a less intrusive government, where the church can then have the resources to be uh, active in it. So, yeah, maybe I maybe I, I conflated the two on that. Well, you you look at what's happened with uh, much of the European church and uh, many European nations that uh, that uh, where uh, charity is uh, part of the tax system. You know, exactly right, and the churches yeah. actually have to apply for uh, money. For capital, for operating. Well, they have a department of religious works, basically, mm-hmm. in the northern European countries, for sure, and uh, and that's the way that works. But you know, we're so, in so this- here. The Pope is uh, is actually uh, is is ceding authority to exactly. to that's governments. A, that is exactly the point. Exactly. And this is why I just run screaming away from stuff like this. Yeah. Well, you also have to recognize that atheism is, has always had a, a, a there's been this um, um, bifurcation, this division in atheism. There, and for those that are that are against um, that that won't, one side of it says we our only hope is government. It's not in God. It's in government. And and the other side of atheism is saying no. It's in being independent, having nothing to do with government. 
I mean, that was back in the old hippie days. You had those that, that wanted to get the government to live off the government system and all the social systems of the government. And then there was the other group that wanted to be out in the woods doing right. their own thing as far away from the government as they could get. But you'd and, admit that same bifurcation exists in Christians, too. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they're not, atheists aren't anything special. No. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that right. why, that's why when you go into the, the, the websites of the libertarian websites and all of that, you find a, a, a large percentage of the people involved in this are not faith-based people <laughs> uh, in terms of Christianity. They're 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 actually a, a ungodly. Mm-hmm. You know, they see libertarianism as freedom from religious con- constraints, not just government constraints, but religious constraints as well. That's the new libertarianism. Which is almost an anarchic, you know, anarchy. It absolutely is. Right? You know, I mean, that's where you get into this borderline. You're getting really close to the edge of um, just pure no government, no control, no authority, no nothing. We're just going to do what we want to do. Everyone did what was right in their own mind and had that work out for them. Yeah, <laughs> that, it just doesn't work. As we're uh, talking today, uh, again, uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, we also talk a little bit about the holidays, and, uh, and we'll maybe look at that spirit, too, coming up in a moment, here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, and, and here with Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegy as we are into our last segment for this show. And again, this show is likely to be airing before Christmas uh, and maybe and may be airing after Christmas, too, depending on schedules here for being able to record a show. Uh, but as we look at the Christmas season coming up, um, we were talking about a lot of the things that have that people think about a lot during this time of year. Charity, about uh, doing good works, about how to reach out to others, perhaps. I mean, this is a time of year when when all around the world, and, and Americans especially, but not all around the world, people are doing more to, to give out of their wallets or to give their time to volunteer, to see that meals are 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 passed along. I just wondered if your churches or uh, that you've been involved in had Christmas traditions along those lines. Of, um, I know uh, we we try to uh, a lot of churches adopt uh, families uh, over Christmas. Or and as uh, Robert, have you experienced some different Christmas traditions out of your church? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how different they are, but we have um, you know we do a caroling evening. It's Sunday night, as a matter of fact, mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to take with us. We have um, um, food baskets mm-hmm. that we take, and friend, this is for the basically the people that find it difficult to get to church for physical reasons or age reasons more than anything else. And so we, you know, our caroling, we go to their homes and we take a basket with uh, with us, and that has all the kind of the the Christmas fixings, if you will, mm-hmm. for them to be able to enjoy that and share that with their family and, and whatnot. So we'll probably do maybe eight or ten different stops on the evening and and sing and do that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So that's that's kind of one of the traditions that we have at the church. Of course, when we were with Mercy Ships, we, we on the ship there were a lot of different traditions. There were 40 different Forty to thirty to forty different nationalities, hmm. and so um, I, it was fantastic because we would have all the the Norwegians and the, the Nordic peoples would do the Santa Maria with the candles on their heads and dressed in white and, and white, and they had special breads that they gave out, and I mean that hmm. would, they would have their night, and we kind of have different ones, and the Islanders, mm-hmm. those from. Um, Tahiti and from um, the islands out in, in the Pacific, they had their special traditions that they would do. And, and theirs was fascinating. One of them, one of the guys was talking about how in, in um, his island, they would actually move to another island, another island community for a week. 
And each year they would alternate which ones they would go either back and forth or to other islands, including this circuit. And uh, so, so the other island would host them for a week, and they would have a week-long Christmas celebration with the, in this other place. It wouldn't be at their home. Hmm. And then the next year they would welcome the other ones to come back. And uh, the tradition on the ship was sort of a Dutch tradition. And you would, I guess there are many European countries that do it as well, but you would put out a shoe outside your cabin door. Mm-hmm. And so at that night, you know, the, the cinder claws or whatever they, the Dutch right, um, right. saying of that, they would come and fill it with nuts and fruit and that kind of, of course, this is That's the old stocking is, tradition. Too, yeah, though. exactly. Yeah. But it'd be your shoe outside the door. And this was, um, this was in Africa. Yeah, when we, when we, this is going on, and uh, so it was uh, it was a fascinating. How much can you get in a flip flop? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you get a pile. <laughs> Doc, how about you? Well, um, you know, All Saints is such a wonderful church, and, uh, and the thing about All Saints is we we've built a lot of traditions over the years. And we keep adding to them, but we never take them away. That's kind of a church thing you do. And so there are, my gosh, we got into Christmas this year, seriously. And there had to have been a dozen different community-focused things that the folks in the church were involved in. I mean, there was the Operation Christmas Child, which is kind of a, a, right. a big deal. But uh, we do a wreath where we uh, pick gifts for our seniors in Carteret County. We help Carteret County Head Start by doing a mitten tree every year. But I think there are about a half, we, we, the food pantry, which is a monthly thing for us, but is a right. big deal in Christmas for Matthew 25. All of these things come up. We're making quilts. We're making hats. We're donating constantly. And so on any given Sunday, you see people coming in with armloads of, you know, canned goods, knitted goods, gifts to put under the tree. It's just, it's a remarkable time of really being committed to this community, which, you know, which we call home. Mm-hmm. And, and I am amazed and so proud of what the Lord has done through the leadership in the church and particularly the, the individuals in the church who take these ministries on and just work like the Dickens, especially during November, December, to get these things accomplished. And then to be able to, you know, to, to have the benefit of traveling out and seeing the faces of, of older adults receiving what might be the only gift they get or of a kid getting a pair of gloves or something. It's just, it's a remarkable time. And it's a reminder. I mean, as all Advent is, I mean, it's a constant reminder to us that things are happening, that that somebody's coming, that somebody's arrived, that somebody is with us. And that that whole idea every year, and this is why I love secular Christmas. I love Santa Claus. I love (laughs) gifts. Because God, even in our secularism, uses that to remind us that there's an anticipation, that there's an arrival, and that there is something that is with us. And to be a part of that during the Christmas season at All Saints is really one of the great joys of life. We have a relatively new youth group uh, in our little church, uh, and it's called The Hangout. And one of the things they're doing is a sock drive. And then they'll take the socks out to uh, some of the homes around here, some of the nursing homes, uh, because that's, uh, you know, foot care is just one of the things that is just really crucial a lot of times for elderly people. And so it's, it's pretty neat, but it's also an opportunity, again, to do both the the stockings legend, mm-hmm. you know, about St. Nicholas, but also to, uh, to talk about the foot washing, too, yeah. that would uh, yeah. go on at the Last Supper. So uh, yeah. we we have an opportunity through that. So that's going to be hopefully a new tradition from that. But then our uh, tradition that is uh, uh, just not many years running, but is a little bit, is our Christmas Eve service is uh, the reading of the Christmas story interspersed with some sort of spontaneous uh, Christmas songs, a cappella, that we just, um, somebody suggests one, we turn to it, and we sing the first verse, or everybody knows the first verse of all the Christmas carols, so you can can spontaneously do that. And then we we end with, we have luminaries out at the end of the, uh, outside the church, so then we'll come and we'll gather around those and sing Silent Night. Uh, for that last one, so uh, those those are a couple of things that even in small churches. Then we reach out. We have um, raised some funds for gift cards that go out to some families that are in our church and in our community in our neighborhood that are that are having some difficult times. So we try to try to touch the, those yeah, lives. This is a really active time. We have a we have two benevolence funds. We have one that's out outward focused, and then we have one we call it the one another. 
mm-hmm. fund where we help folks within the church that are struggling with things. And this is a time when we really emphasize that and, and um, try to help the guy, the folks that are struggling in some way. So, yeah, you know, that whole, you know, we talked about it even with the, with the commandments. It's a, the world can be a dark place. Mm-hmm. And this whole, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, in, in, in um, Isaiah, the, the people who dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know that to me is really what this this um, this uh, celebration that we're doing is really all about the light of Christ coming into this dark world and and, and its timeliness of it and how each year we uh, purposefully reflect on that that uh, dispelling the darkness that the light dis- overcomes the darkness and you know it was C.S. Lewis that said it best I think that the shadow proves the light. Mm-hmm. And that you know that dark that that darkness is really just the absence of light. It's not a thing like light is. Light is a an element. But um, so you know that's what so that's as we celebrate the light of the world. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Then we're reminded that just as with many of our churches, we carry a light out at yes. the end of every service. That we're carrying that light out into the world. Correct. Exactly. Uh, uh, to, yeah. to to be that that body of Christ uh, in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's a um, uh, it's a wonderful time of year, but it's also a time when we uh, want to remember um, uh, our families and also have a chance to be around them and also uh, remember those who have difficult times. Uh, a number of churches do blue Christmas services to help folks mm-hmm. who are having difficult times coping, mm-hmm. and I hope uh, if that's your case, you'll find. Find one that's uh, going on there, but also come and be with others. It's a time to time to be with others, and about- also all the folks that are serving right now, our country overseas. Mm-hmm. I've got one of my dearest friends in the world is uh, uh, out of Lejeune's out out on deployment. Hi, Dave, right now, and um, you know I miss him, and I and and I know how much they miss being with you know his wonderful wife and his three kids and all those guys that are out there and gals who are serving this country right now i i just can't i honestly cannot imagine what it would be like to be in a tent at a desert you mm-hmm. know just far away you know with barely an opportunity to do a little maybe a little facetime a little skyping with the family i mean these guys do so much for us right now and i i really I, we pray for them every day we ask you know we ask the lord to keep them safe and bring them home soon amen Amen to that. Uh, and again, we want to thank you for being part of our uh, regular listening family, too, here on Faith Matters as we uh, conclude this, this about to conclude this year. Uh, again, checking on schedules of whether or not we'll have any other shows for this year or not. Uh, but it's a wonderful time to gather. I know we, we love this time together uh, when we get a chance to spend and talk about these things that, that matter deeply to us, and we hope it matters uh, to you as well, too. So thank you for joining us for this week for Faith Matters. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. of the talk station.